So let me welcome you to the uh, 17th uh, Ingenier uh, Rodolfo De Benedetti lecture. Um, you know, the uh, Ingenier uh, Rodolfo De Benedetti Foundation is a foundation aimed at promoting uh, research, which is also often policy oriented, and also evaluation of research, uh, which is evidence based uh, on uh, social redistributive policies and on labor market uh, policies. Um, um, the, today's lecture is, uh, in a way, is quite unique in the series because uh, it will be uh, uh, largely uh, a lecture on, uh, uh, on the evolution of economic thinking. It's somewhat an history of economic thought also, uh, also uh, and of interaction of, of, of economic thought with, uh, with policy making and uh, with data gathering, I would say, even more so. Um, um, and, uh, you know, also an interesting thing is that it will be done by one of the protagonists of this uh, evolution of economic thoughts about very important issues such as uh, migration and the minimum wage. Um, I won't introduce our speaker because this will be done in a second by Paolo Pinotti, who is also the director of the Fondazione. Um, but uh, um, I just... Uh, I wish to uh, tell you about the format, so there will be this introduction by uh, Paolo Pinotti and then the talk. Um, uh, David can take perhaps only clarifying question during the presentation. Uh, if you have more substantive questions, please leave them at the end. Then we will have two uh, discussants, Erika De Serrano and Simon Gerlach, who will address the two sides of, of the talk, so migration and uh, the minimum wage, and, and then uh, time for discussion. We plan to be over by 7 p.m., so that's the plan, and uh, uh, thank you so much for being here, and uh, we are so happy to have uh, David with us, but uh, the, floor of the, the task of introducing him is for Paul. Uh, thank you, Tito, and uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for coming here, and thanks, of course, uh, uh, to our speaker, uh, to the speaker of the 17th, uh, Rodolfo De Benedetti Lecture, that happens to be also a Nobel laureate in economics uh, from two years ago, 2021, for his empirical contributions to labor economics, right? And this makes me, of course, very nervous and very stressed, right? So. How can you introduce a Nobel Prize in economics? So I thought an easy way out was to say, look, the guy has a Nobel Prize, right? So just listen to him. Probably he's going to say something interesting, I guess. Uh, but then I was trying to do a bit my uh, job, right? Um, and what I want to tell you is uh, what I think the work of uh, David Card meant uh, to people doing uh, applied research in economics, but more generally in social sciences, right? So I'm old enough uh, uh, that I was a PhD student in exactly 20 years ago I started actually, at a time in which uh, we thought, or many of us thought, that the only way to address a very complicated question in social science uh, was to build a complicated or a more complicated statistical model. Right? And we thought that the smartest guy in the room was the guy that was able you know, to, to, to write this complicated model, which, however, in many cases, rely on uh, uh, many assumptions. And some of these assumptions cannot really be tested. Right? Uh, so in my experience, what David Card and uh, many of his co-authors uh, were teaching to me and to other students of uh, my generation, was that uh, to answer this complicated question, you should invest more in understanding really the social phenomena that you're studying, right? And investing in better data about this social phenomena in order to identify some situations or some events that lend themselves to be good experiments, right? So we are in social sciences and we have a hard time performing experiments. 
Sometimes we do that, right? So we randomize treatments across some people or sometimes in a lab, but it's much harder than in natural sciences or in STEM or in physics or in chemistry or in other disciplines like that. So in a sense, we must be smarter than that. We, 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 we must be clever enough to identify some of these situations. And for sure, one of the best examples is the paper by uh, David about the Mariel boat lift, right? So for those of you that don't know this paper, it's about an episode in 1920 in which uh, 120,000 Cubans were fleeing from Cuba and they were allowed to go to the US just because at some point Fidel Castro decided that they could do that, right? And so they all went to basically the same city in the US, Miami, because it was closer geographically. And within just a few months, uh, you have a plus 7% increase in the labor force uh, of Miami, right, coming from uh, migrants. And then what David did was to look at what happened to native employment and wages in Miami compared to the other cities in the US, right? So, and he found uh, that actually there were not strong effects or not as strong as one could have imagined on natives employment and wages, right? And based on this, he concluded that probably the negative effects of immigration on natives, uh, they could have been exaggerated, right? So uh, I think this paper started an entire research agenda in which hundreds of researchers have started to look at what happens in some cities or in some countries where a lot of immigrants come, what happens to natives' employment and wages or other outcomes of interest, uh, leveraging these sort of social experiments that are not created by the researcher, but just by some historical episode or some policy change, right? And hopefully he's gonna tell us more about this line of research today. Now, I want to read a, a, a sentence from another Nobel laureate, probably that, you know, the only person that can prize very well a Nobel laureate is another, another Nobel laureate, that was Daniel McFad that, that once said, a good way to do econometrics is to look for good natural experiments and use statistical methods that can tidy up the confounding factors that nature has not controlled for us, right? So actually, Daniel McFadden, he received the Nobel Prize because actually he was able to build these complicated statistical models, right? So it, he was not the guy that was, uh, you know, afraid of using complicated techniques, uh, but still he acknowledged that these techniques uh, were useful only to tidy up uh, what nature had not controlled for you. So that the main path uh, uh, to, uh, to do convincing empirical evidence uh, is a good natural experiment, uh, not the statistical method itself. So if the natural experiment is good enough, uh, you may just need to compare two group averages, or at most uh, two group averages over time. So this is called difference in differences, and it's one of the methods that was popularized by David Card, uh, to study, among other things, the effect of minimum wages on employment, right? In a, in a very seminal paper with Alan Kruger in 1994. Uh, so the effect of minimum wages uh, on employment has been discussed very much in the US and other countries, including Italy, in the last few years or so, right? Just to tell you how relevant and how fundamental is this question. So, um, I mentioned these two examples of uh, uh, David's research on the effects of immigration and on the effects of the minimum wages because I think they exemplify some of the features that make uh, the research by David really important and fundamental in economics and in social science. So let me uh, list this. So the first one is choosing important topics. I mean, I cannot think about any single paper by David that it's not about uh, a very important question that everybody agrees it's important. Uh, the second reason is that he studies this, uh, these issues using methods uh, that are very rigorous, but at the same time 
quite transparent even for people that are not really trained uh, in economics or in econometrics or in statistical methods. So if you think about that, uh, it's quite easy, I would say, to convey the main message of a difference in difference design, even to some practitioners, some policy makers, some politicians. And this, of course, contributes to make this research uh, uh, very relevant. The third reason why David made economic science uh, very important is that he has been actively involved in disseminating his research and other people's research outside academia. So I remember uh, with Tito about uh, 11 or 12 years ago, we invited David uh, to the Festival of Economics and he was very kind uh, to accept and to uh, participate and present in more than one session about immigration and about other important issues. And by the way, the next weekend is gonna be again at the Festival of Economics uh, in Turin. Um, Finally, last but not least, uh, uh, I got to know many uh, of uh, David Carr's students, uh, and they are all amazing young researchers, right? So I'm sure there's a lot of selection uh, in this, uh, but I'm also sure that there's quite a treatment effect from being exposed uh, to David as a teacher, as a mentor, um, and uh, as a co-author sometimes, right? So actually I'm working with one of them uh, and uh, he's another amazing guy. Um, and finally, and I really promise I'm gonna conclude because I don't wanna steal more time. Uh, another thing that is very important, uh, I have to say David is one of the kindest people in the profession, <laughs> right? Uh, so now there's a lot of discussion about uh, mental health issues in academia and economics uh, in particular. Uh, due to sometimes sort of an obsession with rankings and with publication, this mentality of publish or perish. I mean, we know that some of this has to be there to provide the right incentives, but exactly because of this, it's important to be surrounded by people that are supportive. And I haven't interacted very much with uh, David in my career, unfortunately, but still, in a couple of occasions, uh, uh, I had this opportunity and it was always very inspiring uh, and, and very important. So I remember once uh, I had a paper that had just been rejected from a journal and of course like every time you get rejected it's not pleasant. Uh, but a few weeks later I received this email from David say, ah, you know, I, I saw your paper, I think it's interesting. And for me, you know, it, it was kind of, uh, uh, it was a moment in which I was kind of losing hope in the project and this big guy being, being nice to me was very important to me, uh, right? And I think this is another important contribution that goes beyond uh, uh, the, the excellent quality of, uh, of his research and all his other contributions to academic research and policy making. And uh, with this, I'm very happy to leave the floor to David uh, for the 17th uh, Rodolfo de Benedetti lecture. For, uh, the Rodolfo de Benedetti lecture. Thank you. So um, I start off here on this slide um, with the point, uh, if you're in the United States these days, um, almost all major government agencies now have a chief economist, um, which is relatively new. Um, that started in the uh, late 80s. Uh, Larry Katz and Alan Kruger uh, were chief economists of the Department of Labor. Uh, my old friend Rebecca Blank uh, was the chief economist uh, at the uh, Department of Commerce. And so many, many... Um, uh, um, economic uh, people looking at the world think that economists have a lot of influence. And uh, even back in the 1930s, Keynes had pointed out that it seemed like a lot of practical people were nevertheless sort of uh, messed up by thinking about dead economists' ideas. Um, now, nevertheless, and this is going to be kind of a lesson, I think, for, for my talk, I think we, we know, especially those of us who are actually, you know, running the regressions, we know that economic knowledge is imperfect and um, uh, evolving. So what we used to think we knew uh, can change. Um, and, um, and of course, the social environment is changing as well. So there's no necessary reason why what used to be true is still true. Um, policy options um, depend on things besides the simplest kind of things that economists are often focusing on. And so a lot of times, um, I think economists are frustrated uh, 
by the fact that they've made a recommendation and yet it doesn't seem like it's really going in that direction. And, and a lot of times, and I'll give an example of that in today's talk, um, those I think can be explained um, uh, by thinking along those lines. So I'm going to talk about these two areas, uh, immigration and minimum wages. Now I should say, um, I'm uh, possibly the old, I'm probably the oldest person in the room. So I went to college in the 70s um, before disco. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, so that, uh, and uh, at that time, um, I eventually got into economics and I found out that um, uh, minimum wages were bad and I was taught by people that you would think of as quite liberal, um, uh, you know, mainstream or, or even more liberal uh, mainstream uh, people. But nevertheless, it was widely believed that minimum wage was kind of a, a really good example of something that seems to make sense but turns out to be counterproductive. And of course, economists love that kind of thing. We love it when, when it, what seems to make sense is kind of completely the wrong thing to do. And that was widely uh, seen as an example of that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the traditional view, is, and I grew up in Canada, and there were quite a few people who had worked on uh, immigration, because Canada is a high immigration country, um, believed that immigration was a good thing. Uh, and, and, there were, uh, and that was what I was taught. Um, now, it's, it's important when we're thinking about the 70s in economics to understand that at that time, almost all the analysis was based on uh, annual or quarterly time series data since World War II. So, and that was only basically 30 years of annual time series data. So, there, even though there was, in fact, there was, not only was there only time series data, but there was also just very short years. Um, so what, ha what has happened, I think, in our field is um, that we really started to be able to think of beyond those really simple kinds of, of statistics that were available. And to some extent, that kind of casual empiricism that informed many of the great thinkers in economics in the past, like Adam Smith or David Ricardo, these were not dumb people. Uh, but they didn't really have access to uh, lots and lots of data. They had, you know, they would go around and kind of re think about things and talk to their friends and stuff. Um, so, I, in my view, what economists have been doing, on the one hand, is sort of evaluating benchmark models, uh, trying to understand ingredients of that. Like, for example, in the, in the 70s, a key thing that people, led labor economists worked on, was the labor supply elasticity. Um, and that was thought that there was sort of a number that we could agree on and uh, that we could then use to inform policy on welfare reform. Uh, and then we've been, uh, at the same time as, as, that, as that empirical evidence has come in, we've often had to uh, reconsider uh, alternative theories because a lot of times the evidence didn't quite line up. And so I want to start with the two headlines on these two topics. Um, uh, the, on the immigration side, I always start, any lecture I have to give on immigration, I always uh, start by saying that Malthus was actually wrong, wrong, okay? So, and the reason why I do that is because, strangely enough, um, everybody who's not an economist is a Malthusian. And a surprising number of economists, when it comes to the topic of immigration, are Malthusians, although they're not generally Malthusians when it comes to growth, economic, you know, models of growth. So there's something weird about the topic of economics that brings out the Malthus in all of us. Um, and then uh, the side of minimum wages, I'm going to say my headline is, I think there's increasing evidence that for many employers in many settings, um, you should think about the, the right model is employers are setting wages, and that is going to temper how you think about the effect of minimum. So here's my, um, this is what Alan Kruger used to call side-by-side, -side, uh, where you kind of line up your, your things. I've got the two topics. We're going to start with immigration on the left. And we've got pluses and minuses. So the pluses of immigration expands the economy. And of course, growing up in Canada in the 70s, we only had 20 million people, and it's a very large country. So there was definitely a shortage of people relative to acres of land. Now, some of that land is cold, but it's still short. Uh, it increases the value of land and capital in the country. And it was well known from uh, very simple models of trade that if you have immigration, uh, unless all the migrants are exactly the same as all the natives, then you're going to get a diversification premium. It's back exactly the same as uh, opening up free trade between two countries with different resource endowments. Um, the only minus it was talked about, um, if it was talked about at all in that period, was there was possibly an impact on directly competing natives. 
So on average, uh, natives are going to benefit, but the competing natives are going to be hurt. And um, so the downside of immigration, uh, let's just think about the, the Malthusian thing. They're basically thinking that if there's more people, they're going to compete for the jobs and lower wages. And where that comes from, of course, is Malthus's idea uh, modeling. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I, I've never actually read the book, I have to say. But um, uh, Wikipedia says, <laughs> and as I recall, as I was taught in my course in population economics in 1976, um, Malthus was very much influenced by the fact that it seemed like in Europe, after the Great Death in the 1300s, wages were higher. And actually, standards of living were higher than they had been before. And that persisted for quite a long time. So although it was a terrible, tragic event, there was, the great reduction in population meant that, and you, you can kind of see this in the archaeological record, if you can see places in northern England or Scotland where there was a settlement before 1300, and those are no longer, no one's trying to plow those fields anymore. It was pretty hopeless. And you can see that in North America, the farms around where I grew up, um, there was a margin of cultivation that was further north uh, and no longer is uh, used. So the, basically there's parts of Canada that where they cleared the land that we don't bother trying to farm that land anymore. Um, so that, he was thinking about that world where um, uh, that's what's going on. But on the other hand, we all know that larger cities have more jobs and higher wages. Uh, we know that as women have entered the labor markets, in, the, in most countries, wages have not fallen. There's quite a few interesting studies of that. Um, we know that uh, many countries are starting to subsidize births. The most recent one uh, that's done that is China, but France, Russia, uh, Canada have often had programs to incentivize more births. Um, and some countries like Australia, Canada, and New Zealand actually encourage immigration, in case anybody's you know, looking for uh, you know, exit visa. Um, those are pretty good countries to uh, uh, take a chance on. So Malthus was thinking of a medieval world where there was only agriculture. And so if you had more people, you would have to move to these uh, less productive areas. And um, sometime in the 18th, 19th century, and I was, I've been trying to track this down exactly who was the first one who really wrote down the idea, but we all understand this sort of idea, that if you have more people but you have more capital, you could possibly uh, be okay. And in fact, uh, you know, everybody knows from the Solo growth model, but also the models that preceded Solo's uh, model had that exact feature. So if investment can keep pace with population output, uh, then you can keep wages even. And in fact, Paul Romer won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for his work showing that in fact, there's, there's a good argument that um, more people could actually increase productivity because you get more diversification, you get some increasing returns to scale in some sectors. And it doesn't have to be very big increasing returns to scale to actually add up to significant growth potential. And uh, that's effectively the belief of people in Canada and New Zealand. They think that the country's too small population-wise and you could have more productive uh, population or work, workforce if you had more people. So uh, it's still the case though that if you have immigrant inflows, uh, uh, that are somewhat different than the native population, so unbalanced relative to the native population, then you could still get the Malthusian effect, but only for the subgroup of people who are most competitive. And so the research agenda in this area for the past three decades, and especially the parts that I mainly worked on, um, were uh, uh, trying to think about uh, how do we measure the diversity of immigrants relative to natives, um, and what is the evidence on that diversity and how has that diversity um, manifested in terms of uh, impacts of, of immigrate, immigrant arrivals on natives? Um, and um, basically, I think it's safe to say the leading way of thinking about um, labor force diversity is still an idea that was first proposed in the 1970s um, of education groups. So Richard Freeman, actually, there's kind of an interesting story here. So Richard Freeman is a good friend of mine. He wrote a book. It was called The Overeducated American, saying that um, we've got way too many people going to college and college returns are going to fall and probably not so many people should go to college. That book came out the year I graduated from college. Now, uh, luckily, I didn't read the book first because from then on, the returns to college have been going up ever since. <laughs> so, so remember that when you're thinking about making forecasts on the basis of your estimated models. Um, anyway. Uh, there are other ways to do it. You can use occupation skill group and actually uh, some of the work that Simon has done, uh, Simon has done uh, is along those lines, trying to expand 
beyond just a two-group two model to models where you've got different, uh, subtle, more subtle differences between immigrants and natives. What's the evidence on diversity? Well, if you start from the point of view of two skill groups, college and non-college, interestingly enough, in the US, um, immigrants have about the same share of bachelor's degrees as natives. And actually, that's true in Britain, too. So uh, on average, there's not much to worry about because they're basically contributing about the same number of um, bachelor degrees per person as the native population. So that, that's kind of like balanced growth in this kind of simple model. Uh, what about a more granular analysis? Well, here's data from the US. Now, unfortunately, I, didn't, you know, I don't have any similar data for Italy. Uh, it is substantially different, however. Okay? And it is substantially different in many European countries, so keep that in mind. Um, you can see uh, each of these is one of the education groups. Remember, in the United States, you finish high school after 12 years of education. You finish a uh, bachelor's degree after f four more. Well, no one does, but that's what we say they do. Uh, and then you're supposed to get your PhD after 20 years of school. So keep that in mind, you 30-year-olds who are still working on your PhDs. <laughs> um, OK. So uh, the percent immigrant in those different buckets, you can see ranges from 50% at the very bottom. Now, that's very similar to what we would see in Italy or uh, many European countries, Sweden. Um, kind of flattens out or minimizes at around the middle, around 10% for people with, like, got, have one year of college. Okay, so that's a very big group in the United States. That's ten, more than 10% of the workforce. They went to college for a year. They drank a lot of beer, smoked a lot of weed, and then, <laughs> then somebody said, you better get a job. Okay, so that, that was, I have many friends like that. Um, and then we get to the, the high end group, and you can see that when we get to the very far end in, into the PhD, we're up to 22% again. So there's kind of a U shaped pattern. Um, so the largest concerns in this diversification area are for the very lowest education group and maybe some concern for the PhDs. Okay? So, and so, in fact, a lot of work thinking about immigration impacts and a lot of public thinking on this is actually correctly aligned, I think, that we should be most concerned about. Uh, low-skilled uh, natives who are already in facing substantial difficulties in the last 30, 40 years. And then along comes an extra flow of labor supply, which is going to potentially hurt them. Uh, now, just by way of uh, a little bit deeper dive, uh, if you get to the very top of the education distribution, but you focus on uh, science rather than um, other topics, it's even more interesting. So if you think of STEM, that's science, uh, technology, engineering, and math. Okay? Don't ask me who came up with that acronym. It was probably the same guy that invented the acronym for um, locations in the European uh, nation, nuts. I mean, no English, <laughs> no English speaking person came up with that. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. Uh, okay, so at the, in the STEM level, 21% of all BAs with STEM are, are immigrants, foreign born in the United States, 33%, a third are the masters, and about 30% of the PhDs. But when we get to computer science and engineering, you can see at the PhDs, it's almost half. And you, I was working at Amazon for a couple of years part-time, uh, and basically everybody I worked with, both the computer scientists and the economists, were foreign-born. Okay? They were, uh, I don't think they were lowering my wage, but <laughs> there was a lot of them there. So this is a very pervasive, um, um, in economics, you can see we're about 20 to 30%. Uh, uh, of the uh, are foreign, foreign born in the United States. Okay, so what are the effects of this uh, non-diverse immigration flow? Well, um, it, it, we probably are going to need to look beyond just high school and college. We're going to need to look beyond uh, at a finer level. And so, um, for instance, the Barry Albolif, which we're going to talk about early uh, in a minute, and other work that I've done, and a lot of other people have done, including. Um, uh, people studying, uh, for instance, the UK, have focused in particular at, at, at below high school, where the immigrant impacts are quite large in terms of... Now, how do you get credible evidence on the effects of immigration? Um, so there's a bunch of ways to think about this. Um, I think most people uh, would sort of think, well, it makes sense to think about look at, at different locations, local, local labor markets. So if you think about um, Britain, you say, well, there's a lot of immigrants in London, there's not very, and, and Manchester, but there's not very many in Hull. I don't know if any of you people have been to Hull, but it's, you know, it's a perfectly nice city on the coast. Um, it's not a high immigrant city, um, but there's a problem. Of course, the immigrants aren't going to go to Hull because there aren't very many jobs there. 
So it, you've got uh, immediately confronting this reverse causality. So uh, in the 1980s, late 1980s, when I was at Princeton, I had an uh, undergraduate. Undergrads at Princeton have to give bachelor's degree uh, theses, an honors thesis. They all have to do, every economist. Okay, so I supervised very large numbers of undergraduate theses, uh, and I'm proud to say some of the worst students in the university, I signed off on their theses. But one guy, a very smart guy from, who was from Miami, Constantine Alexandrakis, told me about the boat lift. And he said, this is kind of interesting, and he did a, a little uh, start of an essay on that. He couldn't find any data, so he kind of gave up. And it got me interested in it, and um, I wrote a, a really small paper on this um, that I basically never presented in public or anything. I just sent it to a journal. The referees hated it, but the editor kind of liked it, so it got published. And uh, what I did was I thought, well, the boat lift, I did, did some calculations, and as Paulo pointed out, it looked like the boat lift led to about an instantaneous 7% increase in the labor force, almost all at the bottom of the labor market. So most of the Marielitos were, in fact, very poorly educated, relative, especially relative to earlier waves of Cubanos. And if everybody kind of knows that, because we've all seen Scarface. The opening scene in Scarface, the movie, uh, is about the Marielitos landing. And they were all, just like Scarface, poorly educated. Uh, in some cases had a criminal background, um, relatively thought poorly of even by the, the Cubans in Miami when they first showed up. But they helped them, you know, assimilate a little bit. And of course, they had gone on the boats to get them. Uh, so this is the uh, sort of a, a, a example of this analysis. Now, I have to say, this is not from my paper. This is much better than what's in my paper, but th this shows what you can do. This was actually from a paper by Giovanni Perry, uh, who uh, did a follow-up analysis saying, okay, your card did this analysis, but he started with a, a, an ad hoc comparison group of other cities. Uh, let's try and use some slightly more modern methods to see if we could refine that comparison group. And, uh, but you get the same answer, luckily for me. Um, well, unless you're George Borjas. But, um, you get the same answer, which is in both the comparison group cities, which is a set of cities which tracked Miami in this interval here, and in Miami, uh, log weekly wages were falling in the 70s, uh, particularly for less educated workers. So this is for less educated workers. Okay? And that was a phenomenon across the US. And so you can see what you might have thought. You might have thought if you'd just seen the Miami data, you might have thought, well, it looks like things are going badly here because we've got Things are, you know, we, we've got the, the boat lift occurs here. We've got a log wage of around five, and then weekly wage, and then it's going to go down to about 4.85. So it looks like maybe 15% wage reduction caused by the boat lift. But the comparison group reveals that probably that's not the case. Probably there was something else going on that was affecting low wage workers. Um, so that, the idea of the, of the boat lift. Um, influenced a bunch of other uh, younger researchers that were sort of thinking about, um, you know, could they find other evidence along those lines. Um, there's a kind of a nice paper about the end of the Algerian war leading to repatriation of uh, French colonials back to, mostly to southern uh, France. And it, it, it's got, you know, the data is somewhat limited, but it doesn't, it suggests that even though there was a fairly big inflow of these dudes, it didn't really have a negative effect on the natives in those places. Uh, another one done by the a similar kind of event, the end of the Angolan War. Now that was even bigger inflow because there was a very large number of Portuguese colonials in Angola and they had to get out of there very fast, um, if you remember the story. Uh, so again, you could, but again, the data is a little limited, but it doesn't look like a big problem. Uh, there's more modern analyses. Um, so in 1990, 91, of course, the Soviet Union collapses and a huge chunk of people in this area controlled by Russia, the USSR areas, had some German ethnicity. In fact, my, my wife is from that group. So they were the whole large number of people who were ethnic Germans living in parts of the uh, Soviet controlled areas. And a lot of those people, as soon as the wall fell, they were allowed to go to Israel and, or somewhat to the United States. And so there was a mass migration the largest uh, you know, inflow per capita that we've seen in, with modern data, much larger than the Mario boat lift. Uh, and uh, it doesn't look like even that big an exodus had a huge effect uh, on the Israeli labor market. 
and, and, uh, but it did have an interesting effect. I don't have a slide here, but uh, a friend of mine, Ethan Lewis, had done a really interesting little analysis of capital investment. Okay, exactly consistent with the, what you would think if you're thinking along those Malthusian lines, there was a massive increase in capital investment in, is, in Israel compared to com uh, other alternative countries starting in the mid, uh, early 1990s, and that seems to have really helped. Um, and uh, similarly, there's a, 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 these, so these analyses are sort of pointing to the same kind of uh, evidence that there's, in most cases, relatively small effects on native wages. Now, it doesn't mean there's not a, a zero effect. Actually, um, some of the studies point to a slightly negative effects, but they're not very large, and um, so it doesn't look like that's a major concern. Um, another approach is to use the fact that when there's something going wrong in some sending country to places, uh, countries that have normally been a source of immigration for a country like the United States, when those people come to the new host country, they're going to choose uh, a place to go where previous migrants have gone before from their origin. So, um, Everybody knows, because they watch The Sopranos, that Italians go to New Jersey <laughs> or Guelph, Ontario, where I grew up. Um, but um, there's lots of other examples of that that are actually a little bit stronger. So Polish migrants go to Chicago. Um, migrants from the Middle East, especially from Lebanon, go to Detroit. And that's interesting because, you know, no one in their right mind goes to Detroit, <laughs> unless you're Lebanese and you're getting, you're new to the country. Um, uh, and um, uh, Filipinos go to cities where there used to be a naval base. So they go to Vallejo, California, Richmond, Virginia. And that's because historically, after World War II, Filipinos were given a special visa category. They could come to the mainland and work without any as, um, paperwork as long as they worked for a naval base. Okay, so this is sort of MacArthur, General MacArthur's uh, we're doing. Uh, so you can predict based on that, when there's a big inflow from a given country, that it's going to have differential effects on different cities. And so I had the idea to use that uh, share shift kind of shock. Uh, and um, uh, the biggest source of this would be in, in my data, which I was using data from the 1990s, was uh, Mexico. So after NAFTA, uh, Mexican agriculture was really hurt. And uh, so a lot of migrants from Mexico had to move to the United States. But they all moved to a few cities in Texas and, and Los Angeles. Okay, so Los Angeles goes from uh, relatively, in Chicago. So Los Angeles, of course, maybe you don't know that Chicago is the number two Mexican city in the United States, which is kind of weird, but true. Um, so anyway, th that gives rise to a, a pattern you can um, use as a, as a lever for studying effects. And this is a graph that shows that. So the x-axis shows the log of the relative inflow of low education to middle education immigrants. So what I'm doing is I'm comparing immigrants with less than high school, so that's that pretty large group, to immigrants with something like high school or one year of college. Okay, so the middle of the distribution, I'm comparing, that's the relative inflow. Uh, and there's a wide range in that, across each of these is a city and metropolitan area, and there's an enormously wide range in that, from minus 0.2, minus 20, uh, 20 log points to like 120 log points. So these cities over here are like uh, Texas cities that are getting massive inflows from um, uh, Mexico and South America. And these cities over here, oh sorry, these cities over here are, um, I'll just stop playing with this thing, it's gonna give me trouble. The cities on the left are cities that have, are getting more immigrants from the Philippines and uh, Poland and places like that. And, you, and on the y-axis, I've got the dropout to high school wage ratio for natives, okay? So if you think what's going on is these immigrants are coming in, they're really distorting the relative supply of very low educated people relative to the middle of the distribution, you would expect to see a pretty strong negative slope here. And you can see there's basically no slope. And it's got a fairly precise standard error because it's got such a wide range in the expert. Um, and then a third approach, and that idea has been used uh, in other studies. Um, a third approach is a model-based simulations. This is the more traditional approach. Uh, and I bring this up because people are uh, kind of somewhat surprised when they see the results of this. So this is a, uh, the leading proponent of this is George Boros, and in his most recent book, he goes through a pretty elaborate set of exercises to show how that would work. 
So in, in his model, there's three parameters. So this is a, a, a model of the ma a labor market that has only three parameters. Uh, one of them is the elasticity of substitution between uh, education groups. One is the elasticity of substitution between immigrants and natives with the same education and age. And one is the elasticity of substitution between different experience groups. And it's a nested CES framework, so those three parameters summarize it. And he goes through, a, a, and a, he's assuming that capital can grow with population, and I'm assuming that. Oh, he does some simulations without assuming that, which of course give you a Malthusian result, but let's assume that you get capital grow. And in his model, uh, with the, uh, what I would consider to be the, the, the you know, reasonable estimates of the parameters, and there's a range report in his book, uh, you get that this massive immigration that occurred in the United States between 1990 and, uh, and to 2010 caused wages of natives with ho no high school degree to fall 2%. Now that's not nothing, okay? These guys, this is the low end of the labor market, but it's actually so small that you couldn't really detect it in a time series regression model, okay? And it, given all the other trends that are going on in the labor market, it's essentially equivalent to statistical noise if you had to, 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 to look at the time series of the data. Um, and he ra it raised because it, the Georgia's model has exactly the kind of diversification premium that you get from traditional trade theory. It raises average wages by about 0.6%. So you can see you're, you're hurting um, the very lowest education group by a couple of percents, but the average effect of 0.6% is actually quite a large premium to the economy as a whole. Okay, so if we look at this um, scorecard, it looks like um, the main thing that we learned from that, some of that work is that this um, lower wages for directly competing natives, it's possibly a concern, but it's not a huge concern. Probably smaller than we used to think. Um, there's other uh, studies and other uh, uh, benefits of immigration that people have uh, been focusing on. The traditional view was to look at immigration and say, okay, I think the immigrants of this type have come in, and I'm gonna focus on the effect on natives of that type. That's the main thing that people have done. But there's a, couple, a series of interesting papers by Patricia Cortez and her co-authors where she pointed out that actually if you have immigrants coming in uh, as particularly low educated immigrants, one of the benefits of that might be to high skilled natives who get lower prices or can get access to care for their children or their elder parents. And uh, in these papers they, uh, that I've got here, uh, particularly the 2011 and 2016 uh, papers that she wrote, really, really sh clearly show that effect. Uh, and so that's missing from those tr previous analyses, that you're increasing the ability of, uh, especially mothers, and everybody knows if you're a mother, that it's very difficult to get daycare services. And uh, that could be quite important in understanding the gender gap because a lot of research is showing that uh, one of the components of that is the inability of women to work the longer hours that men are working and keep up in their profession. And so that's one of the possible benefits. Uh, another uh, area that is starting to become interesting, I think, is entrepreneurship. Uh, most studies of immigration, including all of my work and, and George's work, we basically throw out the self-employed because we can't do much with them. Now that turns out to be a problem because uh, immigrants have pretty high self-employment rates and that's a, you may be really understating their uh, situation in the labor market. And so this is a, some new data from a project I'm working on with two friends in Canada. This is administrative data from the tax system. And this is a cohort of men aged 25 to 29 when they arrived in Canada between 2000 and 2004. And we're, so this is all groups of immigrants and we're following them over time and we've got on here the fraction of them who are working in the wage and salary sector, okay, that's the yellow line, and it's on the right scale. The fraction who are in unincorporated self-employment. So that's like, um, you know, you work by yourself. You don't have any employees so you haven't got a, a firm set up. It's just you as a, a single person. And then incorporated self-employment. Now incorporated self-employment is pretty important because that's like starting a company that's hiring other people. And you can see in Canada for, this is all immigrants. I didn't cherry pick the, you know, the ones that are super successful. And so you know, this is lots and lots of mostly Asian uh, immigrants coming to Canada these days. Uh, and you can see that these rates of self-employment are uh, very high. So for, for men, something like 10 to 12% on those two margins. So about almost a quarter of them are self-employed. So that's a very large effect. And you can see how that matters. If you thought I was looking at just the wage and salary status of them, if I was using that as my measure of success, it would look like they weren't doing very well. They weren't assimilating. But one of the reasons why they're not assimilating is because I'm not measuring the right thing. Okay, in fact, their entrepreneur rates 
are much higher than Canadians. Okay, I, I grew up with a lot of Canadians, and the Canadian dream is to watch hockey on Saturday night and drink beer and get a good union job. Okay, so that's <laughs> that's kind of the caricature. And we certainly don't want to, you know, get out there and try and, uh, you know, start a business and hire people because that's a real pain in the ass. But it is true in Canada, as in the United States, that a lot of the large companies that have grown in the last 30 years turn out to have been started by uh, foreign-born people. So that's something that we're missing. Um, so, despite these positive views of immigration from a lot of economic research, uh, immigration uh, is basically, uh, immigration policy is probably going in the wrong direction. It's going in, in more, a more harsh direction. Uh, and so I, it got me thinking uh, some years ago in a paper with Christian Dussman and uh, Ian Preston, we got thinking about this and we said, what are we missing? And uh, here's the, what we decided. We decided that people probably care about economic impacts of immigration and they might even care about the economic impacts of immigration on other people. They might be you know, altruistic in that regard. But they uh, also care about what you can think about as the, um, the neighborhood compositional effects of immigration. So that's something that's a, their, their effect on the schools, on the uh, fraction of people that um, their kids are uh, possibly dating, things like that. And, and we, so in the early wave of the ESS, we asked a set of questions about what you thought about the economic impacts of immigration and about these other impacts of immigration. And we tried to see how those two sets of answers were related to your views about immigration policy. And since I'm running out of time, I'll just get, I'll show you the questions. The economic ones are on the left, the compositional questions on the right, and they all kind of, you know, very simple questions from earlier work. You can see we took an average of the ones on the left. We called that an economic view about the effects of immigration. We took an average of the one on the right. We called that your compositional views. And it turns out that the compositional views account for about 80% of the variation across people in what they think about immigrant policy. And this explains a few puzzles, like why do old people not like immigrants, even though the economic impacts of immigration for old people are obviously positive. Because who else is you know, going to clean their house and take care of them in the hospital? It has to be, you know, there has to be something else that's driving their, that decision. And it's because those, especially older people, are very, very concerned about compositional issues. Uh, okay, so um, let's go on to minimum wages. Um, that, as I said, when I was a, a student, uh, it was kind of a pretty, pretty across the board negative. So immigration reduces employment, reduces investment, and raises consumer prices. Okay, so that's, that's all pretty bad. Uh, the possible plus is it's possible that you could raise the incomes of lower paid workers. And I should say that that was extremely controversial. So actually, if you read some, many of the papers up into the 1980s, there was a prevailing view that what happens when you raise the minimum wage is that low wage workers are completely unemployed. So although they could potentially get a job, they're not going to get those jobs and so the, their incomes are actually going to fall. Or another way to put it is the elasticity of labor demand is much above one. So total earnings of the low wage labor force is going to fall. So the, the traditional view actually, for instance, in uh, George Stigler's seminal article on minimum wages was that it sounds superficially like you could raise the minimum wage and you end up helping low wage people, but in fact you're going to hurt them because they're not going to get the jobs. So um, the key assumption here, of course, is the same kind of assumption that we use in a lot of the immigration related work, which is very sa simple supply and demand models. Um, if it was known, starting in the 30s, Joan Robinson uh, had shown, and then other people you know, realized this was true and, and talked about it somewhat, that if you had a minimum wage when firms have wage setting power, you wouldn't necessarily get that reduction in employment, and you could get an increase in wages and an increase in earnings. And um, so that, that's basically f was known to be true as a, a modeling point, but it was widely thought that it was irrelevant. It was like a, something that was a curiosum. You, you might teach it as an example of, well, it just goes to show with economic theory, you can get anything if you really want, but everybody knows it doesn't make sense that firms can set wages. So uh, how do you get credible evidence on this topic? Well, again, I think the, the idea that Alan Kruger and I exploited, and we had both you, written papers prior to our um, New Jersey minimum wage study, but using the same ideas, but uh, we basically thought, well, we would try and study 
incidents where the minimum wage went up in one place but not in another and compare. So it's sort of like the Marielle Boatlift design, but uh, studying uh, minimum wage increases. And uh, we did that. We had a control group of uh, restaurants in Pennsylvania. The minimum wage was going to go up in New Jersey. We surveyed the restaurants just before the increase, then we surveyed them after. Um, we, had, we did a lot of work trying to make that comparison as valid as we could, so we made sure we didn't have any attrition. We didn't lose any stores that didn't answer the survey. Um, we tried to have um, uh, um, similar uh, answers for uh, looking at the question of whether high-wage restaurants and low-wage restaurants within New Jersey were differentially affected by the minimum, what would we find? But, but, and our, our answer was that, in fact, raising the minimum wage, if anything, seemed to have a slightly positive effect in New Jersey, not statistically significant, so call it a zero. And at the time, that was, I have to say, it wasn't very widely accepted. <laughs> um, I've got, man, I've got many collections of quotes. Um, I don't usually display them in public because it's a little embarrassing. But there, there was definitely a lot of people, including many very famous economists, who thought that we must have been you know, taking drugs or faking the data. Actually, a lot of people thought we faked the data. Um, so um, now what's turned out subsequent to that, using more and more evidence uh, in the last couple of decades, is it looks like that's not a bad first order approximation. Now, it isn't always the case that you find no employment effects in minimum wages, but most of the studies tend to find small effects. For example, there's a very nice paper by Sensig et al. in the QJE last year, I guess it was. They pool 138 state-specific minimum wage increases, and they've got data from before and after, so they, Al and I didn't have a pre-trend data. We, didn't, we couldn't see that stores in New Jersey and Pennsylvania were trending the same. Later on, in a, in a kind of follow-up study, we showed that was true. But. So these guys have a very large number, and they pool the data and look at changes in employment in different wage bins, which is a pretty clever idea. Um, and their, their analysis looks like this. It shows that uh, these are the wage bins relative to the minimum wage. So the, the, just around the minimum wage is here, that there's a big reduction in the fraction of people who earn just less than the new minimum wage, and a big increase uh, in the people who are just a little above the new minimum wage, within a two dollars above it, and then actually there's some spillover effects, and the cumulative is the red line, and so when you get to a spillover point of four dollars, so uh, uh, including everybody up to four dollars above the new minimum, you're back to zero again. Okay, so that that's the kind of analysis that's been done, and as I said, this is you can see these are very precise, so quite a bit, way more precise than what Alan and I had. And there's a, it's coming from a very you know, credible set of event study designs with lots and lots of controls and stuff. So this, I think there's fairly good evidence. Um, there's more international evidence. So the UK in the 90s introduces a minimum wage. Contrary to his predictions by some you know, people, it didn't seem to have had big negative effects. 2015, Germany introduces a minimum wage. Um, and that was actually e kind of interesting because the head of Angela Merkel's Economic Council, uh, my old PhD student, Christoph Schmidt, was very strongly against the minimum wage increase and thought that this was going to be pretty negative. And there were pretty widespread predictions that it was going to cost between half a million and a million jobs uh, by you know, pretty well-known German economists. Uh, it doesn't seem like that happened. So the, the, the net employment effects were probably zero. Um, and so people are still analyzing that, but there's a lot of good data in Germany, and so people will be analyzing that for many years. So uh, I'd say there's broader picture, uh, there's growing evidence that uh, in, outside of the minimum wage area, there's growing evidence that it looks like um, employers do have wage setting power. If you look at turnover behavior as it's related to wages, or if you look at recruiting flows as related to wages, you see very strong evidence that uh, it, that's consistent with a very simple uh, d dynamic monopsony kind of models. And um, there's also growing evidence that employers don't all pay the same wage. So even in the same labor market, for the same skill group, for the same person as they move between firms, their wages are going to systematically change. So uh, gradually, I think, we've learned that our, this simple model, the supply and demand model, may not have been quite as, as, as strong. So the, the, I would say if we return to the scorecard, We've uh, got pretty good evidence that the, uh, that the employment effects of minimum wages are quite a bit smaller than you would have predicted. And maybe to first order, in, in, in a lot of cases, close to zero. Um, 
less, there's still a little bit of debate going on. The macroeconomists have rolled into this one recently, a model-based analysis suggesting that minimum wages kill investment. Um, so that, that's going to take some time because, you know, you can't really win an argument with a macroeconomist. Um, <laughs> raise consumer prices, that's definitely true. It does look pretty systematically like minimum wage increases do cause some price increases. Um, and there's a little bit of evidence, I think, gradually getting stronger and stronger that we are raising the wages of low-paid workers and increasing their standard of living, reducing poverty, and so on. Uh, so I think, I think the, the view on this is, is more positive. Now, the policy response here, it's a little hard to say. I would say for the first 10 years after Alan and I's work, nothing happened. So there were no increases in anybody's minimum wages. Um, we, you know, we were kind of um, thought to be kind of made into laughing stocks. Uh, I, I think it would be safe to say. But somehow by 2000 or so, things started to change uh, in the U.S. and then other countries. And so gradually the, the, the tide has turned. And nowadays, like the EU has introduced a, a standard for countries to have a minimum wage and to have it at a certain level, maybe too high for some people's taste, but at a certain level. Around the world, there's some thinking. So it's possible, I wouldn't say for sure, but it's possible that some of this was driven by the findings. Uh, and maybe the accumulation of findings, including all these really great new research designs. So, um, conclusions. Um, we now understand uh, much more about the effects of immigration and minimum wages empirically than we did. We know that these very simple models are probably not so great. The state of the art is massive data sets, administrative data sets that cover all the employers in the country. Um, and. Uh, allow you to follow uh, individual workers and individual firms responses to things like immigration or minimum wages. Many economists, not all, in fact, you know, half of economists have sort of updated their go-to models. Um, younger economists, of course, are going to change their ideas. Old economists never change their ideas. So, yeah. so as we, we're going to have to kill them all off before we actually change, change the majority. But uh, research has possibly influenced minimum wages, probably not influenced immigration policy because I think most of what we've been studying is not really the first order thing in setting immigration policy. Uh, it's a little less clear how economists contribute. I'm, you know, Baconi is a place where people do a lot of research on political economy kind of ideas. So this is possibly a place where people will make some breakthroughs and think about how to think about the economics underlying this perceptions of immigration affecting neighborhoods and schools and uh, changing the composition of the economy in negative ways, how that, how that is mediated in some kind of uh, thinking. So the good thing, I think, for younger people is that there's many open questions, even in these two areas, which have been worked on to death. Uh, there's always something to do. But also, some of the same ideas and some of the same concepts have been, uh, are, are out there to apply to lots of other areas. And so, I think that um, the design-based research has helped make the field um, not just more empirical, but also, a, first of all, more interesting to people who aren't just math mathematically good, so people who you know, are actually interested in social phenomenon and not just the uh, integration. And um, secondly, it, it, it's because I think it, it helps to broaden it out. You need a lot of people when you're trying to do empirical studies. If you're trying to do theoretical studies, you don't need too many. One Gerard de Brooke can kind of straighten out the entire field of general equilibrium for 10 years. But that's not really true with empirical work. So there's more openings for the future. So I'll stop there.